Hello, and welcome to the CLL Society's webinar series. I'm Patricia Kaufman, co-founder and communications director of the CLL Society, welcoming you to today's webinar entitled, Just Diagnosed, What Do I Need to Know? This webinar was designed to provide you with critical information and to answer your questions covering the time period from newly diagnosed to first treatment. Prior to beginning today, I would like to mention a few reminders. All attendees on today's webinar are muted. Please direct all questions to the Q&A section displayed at the very bottom of your screen. Scroll down with your mouse and the Q&A box will appear. Feel free to enter questions throughout the webinar. Our speaker will answer questions that have been submitted during the course of the presentation. Your questions will only be available and visible to the speakers and CLL Society staff. After this webinar, you will receive a short survey. Please provide the CLL Society with your feedback. Your comments are very important to us as we continue to build this educational resource and plan for future webinars. This webinar is being recorded and made available to everyone on our website at CLLsociety.org under Support Group Education section as an archived educational activity approximately one week after the completion of this webinar. In addition, everyone who completes this webinar survey will be and provides a mailing address will receive a free CLL specific bag from Bagot, which includes important information and resources that can help guide patients in talking with healthcare providers, asking questions and documenting information. We'd like to thank Genentech, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Adaptive Biotechnologies for making this webinar possible through their grant support. At this time, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Brian Kaufman, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the CLL Society. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Brian Kaufman here. Thank you, Patty, for that kind introduction. And uh, I'm the lucky one against to introduce my friend and our speaker today, Dr. Neil Kay. Dr. Kay is a professor of medicine, a staff consultant, and a career scientist in the Division of Hematology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and has dedicated his life's work to understanding the biology and the management of CLL and takes us on a journey from the very beginning, sort of a pre-CLL through CLL until the actual moment of needing treatment. Dr. K, let's start with the, the polling questions here before you get, give all the okay. um, information. Since there's just two polling questions here. The first question is, I am confident that I know what tests and workup are appropriate as part of my early CLL care. And you have a scale that goes from strongly agree at the top to strongly disagree at the bottom. And the second question is, is I am confident that I know what routine medical care and vaccinations I should receive as part of my early CLL care that goes from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And here we have some answers here. So it looks like about a third of the people strongly agree and uh, are, agree at least that they have confidence in their testing, but there's a significant number that are more than half are neutral or don't feel comfortable with that. And when we look at terms of early medical care, um, the numbers are, are pretty similar. About 60% are neutral or disagree or strongly disagree that they're on top of what early medical care and vaccinations they need. So it sounds like this is a very appropriate uh, webinar for you, Neil. So, so I hand it over to uh, Dr. K. Dr. K, thanks very much. Thank you, Brian. I was very pleased to be able to give this webinar and to talk about early stage CLL. I very much appreciate your comments. And I do also um, want to acknowledge uh, the participants that are listening to this webinar. So the uh, title is um, of the webinar is Just Diagnose, What Do I Need to Know? And the objectives are listed here for you. I will focus on four primary areas, the diagnosis issues, what is my prognosis if I do present with early stage CLL? And here I'm specifically referring to rye 
zero to one? What would be my expected standard of care over the next several years? And this is under the assumption that there is no progression and uh, need for therapy. I will throughout the talk be discussing a relatively new entity, but one that we all need to be aware of, and that is monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis or MBL. The lymphocytosis means an excess of blood lymphocytes. Uh, and I'll get into that in more uh, specifics about MBL. In particular, I'll focus on diagnosis and clinical aspects. The important part of this entity is to uh, realize that we believe now that this is the precursor to obvious overt CLL. Now, some beginning comments about nomenclature. We're really in this talk, not just talking about CLL, but also small lymphocytic lymphoma or SLL. And as I mentioned, MBL, and there is some overlap with these entities. CLL is predominantly, uh, will predominantly present as a lymphocytosis. SLL will um, perhaps more predominantly present uh, to the physician uh, for, uh, with a, for a patient who has large lymph nodes. And MBL is a, the presence of the CLL B cell, but really no other hints that there is any uh, uh, other problems. So those are the three entities we'll be discussing. So how do I know I have CLL? There are some very clear cut diagnostic criteria for CLL and SLL. We must be able to show the presence of monoclonal B lymphocytes. When I talk about clonal, monoclonal or clonal, these are really, uh, if you will, saying that they're malignant. And the only way to really show that now, the gold standard is flow cytometry, which is really a uh, technical jargon for a pretty fancy machine that tells you what the membrane of that lymphocyte looks like, and it is adequate for diagnosis. The presence of the flow cytometry definition of the clonal B cells must be accompanied by an absolute B lymphocyte count greater than 5,000 uh, per, per microliter. For MDL, this is a clonal population as in CLL, but in this case, the absolute B lymphocytes are less than 5,000. Now, in regard to SLL, it is not typical, but it can have, it can occur that because there is more lymph node presentation on the physical exam than there would be for CLL, the lymph node biopsy may be done first. However, very often a blood test or flow is, is, is adequate. If not, a lymph node biopsy can be done. We usually want an adequate specimen. This usually requires an excision which really means, uh, if you will, a large chunk of tissue is taken from the node, and then this can be examined for these clonal B lymphocytes. Now, I do want to mention uh, familial CLL, and this is because CLL has one of the highest familial risk of disease among, among malignancies. Family history of CLL is the strongest known risk factor for developing CLL. Individuals with a first degree relative with CLL, we have now determined have an eight and a half fold increased risk of CLL. Now it is also important to realize that the prevalence of MBL in first degree relatives of CLL is 13 to 18%. We and others have found this. It is higher than the five to 10% prevalence of MBL found in the general population. In other words, those individuals who are not part of a family, but are, are if you will, sporadic um, uh, CLL patients. We now know that there are uh, 41 genetic variants for CLL susceptibility. When I say genetic variants, these are 41 different genetic sites that predict for the development of CLL. These are not absolute, but do contribute to the possibility of getting CLL. So let's now assume that we do know that uh, CLL is present. What is my prognosis? That should usually be the next major activity uh, by your caregiver. So just to review this, um, this is uh, fairly uh, well known and established that there is a wide variability in the clinical behavior and aggressiveness of CLL. 
Some patients will live decades without treatment. Individuals may be diagnosed in their 50s or 60s, for example, and may, uh, may live out their lives uh, without any need for therapy. However, others develop symptoms quickly. In the past, it was much more difficult to predict this, but now we use a number of tools to try to predict future disease behavior for a given individual. It, the, uh, the old way, if you will, was to use RISE stage. Dr. RISE de um, developed and defined five RISE stages, which I'll review in a moment. There are uh, more modern prognostic tests that are reflecting the biology of the CLLB cell that can be used. But increasingly, we're using combinations of these prognoses, prognostic tests to come up with models. And I'll illustrate one that we find very helpful in a moment. So as I mentioned, the clinical behavior in CLL uh, can be very heterogeneous uh, because of uh, modern technology. Uh, most patients, probably 80% or more, will be diagnosed with stage zero disease, which is just lymphocytosis, just an elevated lymphocyte count found on a complete blood count. However, even in stage zero patients, there is significant variation in clinical experience for a given stage zero individual. Now, as I mentioned, RISE stage was a, a, a very defining moment in the history of CLL, being able to categorize patients from RISE zero through one, two, three, and four, where the characteristics change from lymphocytosis to then adding uh, large lymph nodes, having uh, an enlarged liver or spleen or ganomegaly, being anemic and then being thrombocytopenic. And you can see the median survivorship and this, the, the uh, third column here shows you median survivorship that was calculated perhaps in the early 21st century. Uh, we updated this in 2009 based on our experience of almost 2,400 patients at Mayo Clinic. And you can see that for RISE 0 and 1, there was a definite uh, increase in the overall survivorship to 168 and 120. But notice that uh, particularly uh, RISE four and five had a significant increase. Uh, and this is probably because of the uh, efficacy, the benefit of chemoimmunotherapy with protocols such as FCR. Now, since that time, we've added novel agents like a brutinib and a calibrutinib. And I wanna share with you a recent update that we've uh, undertaken at Mayo Clinic, where we looked at the median survivorship of newly diagnosed patients using a 2008 international workshop criteria. And, th and these uh, overall survivorships are regardless of whether they receive treatment or not. And the column I want you to pay attention to is in the red box. You can see that the median overall survivorship for zero and one has really not changed that much. Uh, it is around 154 and 140 for rise zero and one. And even with the advent of novel agents, we're still looking at overall survivorship. Uh, that while improved from the early 21st century, uh, are still holding at about the same level. Now, how can we improve upon predicting risk of progression for a given CL patient? We, along with the colleagues in the German CL study group, looked at multiple markers. These are multiple different prognostic mar markers. And we, um, this, this work uh, pooled the analysis of eight phase three trials, uh, which are the most mature trials you can use to evaluate CLL patients, almost 3,500 patients. And it ended up that there were five factors that independently uh, associate with survivorship. And these are listed here for you. Age greater than 65, a clinical stage greater than rise zero, an IGHV unmutated, which basically means that the gene coding for the heavy chain variable region has no mutations. Beta-2 microglobulin, which is a plasma serum test, and a deletion 17P or TP53 picked up by fish test or by genetic analysis. And you can see that the points are increasing as you go down through the five markers. You add these points and you end up with a score from zero to 10. Now the value of this is shown on the next slide where we're we're showing you risk groups, low, intermediate, high, and very high. That is risk for progression and decreased survivorship 
And what you see, the most pertinent aspect here is the survivorship after five years. It varies widely based on this modeling where uh, rise zero to one is at 93% survivorship, whereas very high would only be at 23.3%. Now, we at Mayo Clinic have actually validated this prognostic tool for early stage CLL, we, and this is zero to one, and we do use it routinely to monitor, to, to come up with a prognostic risk score for uh, our patients. So why use prognostic tools? There actually are a number of other features that are listed here that, we, um, that make us want to do this. One is counseling, and obviously knowing a good prognosis can be as important as knowing a bad one. It, we do use it to determine follow-up, the pace of when we see a patient, what's based on risk of recurrence. So, uh, we do consider early intervention if there is high risk, particularly if there is a clinical trial that would be uh, appropriate for a given patient. And uh, the, the treatment selection um, is, is valuable. It was more valuable when it was only chemoimmunotherapy. The reason for this is that 17P uh, patients, CL patients who have a fish defect where 17P defect is present or P53 mutation do not benefit as well with chemoimmunotherapy because of the um, ability of novel agents to be more effective, even in the higher risk. Uh, this is perhaps a little bit less uh, of value. So I just wanted to show you uh, early stage management uh, based on uh, us using the CLIPI. That what I showed you earlier was the uh, inter International Prognostic Index, or the um, jargon is the CLIPI. So if, if we have an early stage asymptomatic patient and they're segregated uh, on, based on the CLIPI, if they're lower intermediate risk, we would probably mostly observe. But if there was a clinical trial with a low toxicity agent that had some favorable preclinical activities, we might consider counseling the patient to go on that trial. However, if the patient is high and very high by the CLIPI, as you saw, the survivorships are very much different than the low and intermediate risk. And so we would either observe them, perhaps with an increased frequency, of it maybe every three months instead of every six. However, we would potentially offer a clinical trial, and I will mention right now there is a clinical trial for, uh, for high and very high risk where uh, these individuals are randomized to a calibrutinib alone or a calibrutinib with obinutuzumab. There is a placebo arm for individuals who are low risk. So assuming that uh, there has been a fairly thorough prognostic evaluation and you're firmly in the early stage phase, what would be your standard of care? So this is basically a practice plan that we use at Mayo Clinic. And in regard to the initial evaluation, I wanna go through this uh, for you. What we recommend is that there be a hematology consultation. There are two reasons for this. One is that flow cytometry, that fancy machine I told you that maps the outside of the CLB cell is absolutely essential in confirming the diagnosis. There can be uh, lookalike diseases, but they're not CLL. So it's important to have an experienced consultation in that regard. In addition, we have found and published that there are differences in overall survivorship for CLL patients, depending on who they see uh, at some time early in their course. In other words, expertise matters. And we can talk about that more perhaps in the Q&A, but uh, we think it's important to have, if you will, a CLLologist see you at least once uh, during the initial evaluation. The blood work that we consider important to do is a complete blood count with the differential of the white cells that are present, a platelet count, so-called complete blood count, chemistries that help us to assess liver and kidney function. The reason we do that is that ultimately if a patient is gonna require therapy, it's important to know if their liver and kidneys are working well. We do like to check the immunoglobulin levels, IgG, IgA, and IgM, 
50% of all patients will ultimately develop low levels. The reason this is important is that these are the molecules that fight bacterial infection. And if they're low, we could replace these with uh, intravenous gamma globulin or now intramuscular uh, gamma globulin. They do not associate with any particular outcome, however. In terms of genetic studies, we are uh, very keen on doing a seal of fish panel. This is a fluorescence in situ hybridization panel. I apologize for the jargon, but basically you need to know it detects all common genetic abnormalities in CLL, and there are six. They should include a probe to exclude a diagnosis of mantle cell. The reason for that is that mantle cell can look very much like CLL but the treatment and the outcomes are different. We also focus on the IGHV mutation status uh, where we want to discriminate between unmutated, that is there is no mutation in that gene versus the mutated status. And the reason for that uh, quite simply is that the mutated IGVH uh, patients have a better outcome than the unmutated. Now, there are some other tests that we would consider doing uh, that aren't necessarily part of the routine. We would consider doing TP50, TP53 sequencing. Uh, this is, uh, again, reading the genetic code of the gene. We would particularly favor this if during the first year, even though the FISH test was negative for 17P, if the patient had more aggressive clinical behavior that was inconsistent with low risk. We don't necessarily do a bone marrow aspirin biopsy unless a patient was on a clinical trial. So we do not consider it necessary for the initial workup, considering that the blood is sufficient for flow cytometry. However, if the patient develops low platelets or is anemic or symptomatic, chills, fever, night sweats, we would consider doing a bone marrow. CAT scans uh, with contrast, looking at the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, are not typically done initially, but if there was a predominantly small specific lymphoma type presentation where there was a considerable amount, considerable amount of enlarged lymph nodes, we might consider doing that. So what do we uh, do with the, the newly diagnosed asymptomatic CL patient? Typically, and again, this is typical, for year one, there would be a CBC in exam every three to six months. We would be um, thinking about seeing the patient more frequently if there's high risk fish, such as 17P or P53, uh, uh, found in the initial evaluation. For year two and beyond, if the patient has been stable with all of their parameters, feels well, no changes in physical exam, we might increase the follow up to every six to 12 months. And again, we still intermittently evaluate kidney and liver function for the reason I stated earlier. There could be additional testing, particularly if there is recurrent bacterial infection. So one thing that is important to know is that even if patients are not advancing uh, in terms of say rise stage or having more obvious progressive CLO, there still is a risk for recurrent bacterial infections. And we consider that due predominantly because the immune system is not completely normal, even in early stage. And one of the tests that we would do, again, is to measure IgG, A and M, because if these are low and there were recurrent bacterial infections of the series, we could consider the infusion and replace these proteins. And that is helpful in some. I briefly want to mention indications to start therapy uh, I think it's an important part of this talk, even though we're focusing on CLO. And there is a definite agreed upon international gold standard criteria. This is published in blood in 2018, uh, the international workshop of the so-called IWCLL. The uh, patient should have B symptoms, fever, night sweats, or weight loss, evidence of marrow failure where there is anemia with a hemoglobin less than 11, platelet counts less than 100,000, Progressive and potentially symptomatic, maybe painful lymph nodes, enlarged liver or spleen, and possibly even autoimmune complications, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and immune thrombocytopenic purpura, this abbreviations AIHA and ITP, I put in for you 
because you may have seen these or heard about them. Basically what these are, are antibodies directed at uh, your own red cells or antibodies directed at your own platelets. This is an aberrant uh, immunologic disorder and may call for therapy uh, if uh, uh, other approaches don't work. I do want to in indicate that one or more of these may lead your caregiver to suggest uh, initiation of therapy. You don't necessarily have to have all of these. Very often there are at least uh, two of these in a given patient who's progressing. One other aspect I want to emphasize is that in terms of indications to start therapy, recurrent infections are not an indication to start treatment. However, infections may transiently increase your total weight count, but this will improve with resolution of the infection. You may see transient increases in your lymph nodes or your white cells or both, especially the lymphocytes with insect bites. I've had patients who've been bitten by a mosquito with their neck lymph nodes dramatically increase, but with resolution of the bite, they disappear. They disappear. There, I, did, I also want to emphasize that just having a total white count go up and nothing else is uh, occurring is not an indication for therapy. I have had patients who have had white counts uh, well above 100,000 who have never been treated, but that's all they've had. Let me just uh, briefly deal with monoclonal B-cell cytosis in terms of the diagnostic criteria. MBL, as I mentioned, is classified by having this leukemic, this CLL B cell in the blood. However, there are three types. There's a CLL-like MBL, a non-CLL-like MBL, and an atypical MBL. And I apologize for the jargon, but these, are, these have different courses, and it's important to know if it's CLL-like. In addition, to add to the complexity, there are now two, count, two types of MBL, low count and high count. The, um, Look, the high count uh, is based on the fact that the absolute B lymphocytes are anywhere between three and 5,000. The low count are obviously less. For the high count MBL, as I mentioned, flow cytometry should be consistent with CLL. And actually it is now a recognized entity. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that it had its own diagnostic code. And I'll explain why that is in a moment. For an individual with MBL, there is no other abnormality. There is no other abnormality in the complete blood count. There is no enlarged lymph nodes. There is no enlarged liver or spleen, and there are no symptoms. So basically, it's almost picked up serendipitously. We often find that these individuals come to us because they were having a well physical exam and an increased lymphocyte count was noted incidentally. What do we do initially uh, for these? Uh, MBL high count patients, we recommend a physical exam to make sure there are no lymph nodes. The CBC and differential and of course flow cytometry, if the flow cytometry was done outside of Mayo Clinic and they do come to see us, we like to repeat our own because uh, we found that sometimes we don't agree. So we want to confirm that this is CLL-like uh, MBL. So the hematology consult consultation for an MBL is much like a newly diagnosed CLL. Important to see a hematologist who's familiar with this entity and determine if it's CLL versus non-CLL uh, phenotype. And um, the, the other point to mention, just to drill down a little deeper, is that for the non-CLL phenotype, even though they look like MBL, there may be um, additional evaluations warranted, including bone marrow biopsies, and CT scans because these individuals may have a more aggressive course. Now, what about the clinical features? You remember I, I mentioned that um, there is some reason to have a diagnostic code for uh, the high count. So the incidence, just to um, um, make sure that you are aware, this is not that uncommon. For an otherwise healthy individual, if we took 100 people um, uh, in a given area, we might find that 4 to 5% of those um, in a, 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 out of 100 would have MBL. We now know, know that high count MBL has an incidence of 3.5 per 100,000 person years. So it's not uncommon. It's shown to progress to CLR requiring treatment at a rate of 1 to 2% per year. 
However, there are complications that are much like CLL. There is definitely an increased incidence of second malignancies. And while this is more typically skin cancers, the non-melanoma type like basal and squamous, that does also include melanoma and to a certain extent, uh, solid tumors. There is also an increased rate of serious bacterial infections. And we've now found and published that this is true for both high count and low count. So uh, while I won't get into this in great detail, we actually believe that for a high count MBL, their risk of having these complications is more um, significantly uh, obvious compared to them progressing uh, to have CLR requiring treatment. So what's our follow-up for newly diagnosed MBL? We recommend a CBC and physical exam in six to 12 months, and then if those are normal annually thereafter, additional testing would obviously be considered if there is symptoms or progressive anemia or low platelet count. Patients with low count MBL, uh, another way of defining them is cells per microliter rarely progress. Patients with high count, as I mentioned, progress to CLR requiring treatment at the rate of one to 2% per year. You've heard that earlier. So let's turn now, uh, uh, lastly, to supportive care. And we think this is a very important issue for early stage CLL. And, and it's sometimes, I think, not exactly, is not recognized completely um, by all uh, caregivers, but we do think relates a lot to management of complications that can be seen in early stage. So these are our guidelines. First, immunization, which we think is critical. Prevnar 13, which is to prevent pneumococcal pneumonia, should be uh, initially, for those who've not been uh, immunized before, is Prevnar 13 followed by Pneumovax 23, and they should be about two months apart. Uh, influenza, actually right now the CDC is recommending uh, that almost all individuals get influenza vaccinations, but we certainly would recommend it uh, for CLL patients. And there are two doses, there's a low and a high dose, and we would recommend the high dose. And the reason for this is that we're not completely convinced that CLL patients respond as well to vaccination. Avoid live or attenuated vaccines. These can be risky for actually developing uh, that particular um, viral infection. I'll, I'll come back to that in a, mo in a moment. I'll give you more details on that. Uh, however, there is some advance that's um, been very um, important to know, to know about. We do recommend this for a patient since a recombinant shingles vaccine, basically um, uh, a particular protein codes for an important uh, immunogenic component of the shingles virus. It's called Shingrex, and um, it's really quite, um, it's quite reasonable to have that in uh, that vaccination procedure, and I'll go into that in more detail. There should be little or no risk in uh, accepting that vaccination. We do uh, strongly recommend age-appropriate cancer screening and health maintenance. This certainly, uh, certainly should apply to early-stage patients, even more so because of the potential for no progression to CLL. Yet, as I mentioned, second cancers can be seen, and I have not emphasized, but I will now, that they can behave more aggressively. Uh, particularly skin cancers, the non-melanoma type, the squamous cell cancers uh, in a given early stage patient may be um, more aggressive and needs to be followed and dealt with aggressively. And make sure that uh, we do recommend that for skin cancer prevention, that patients are educated, that they see a dermatologist who knows about full skin exams. That's basically the terminology we use. And we want our, our patient to definitely get at least an annual exam for a full skin or a whole body skin exam by a, a dermatologist. If there is no, uh, if there's no pre-malignant or malignant lesions, you could probably go every year, or maybe one or two years. But if there is a, a skin cancer detected, we recommend uh, going to that dermatologist perhaps every six months. With regard to the immunizations, I neglected to mention, but there are some very nice CDC guidelines, and I've included the uh, website uh, for those guidelines. However, I do want to uh, get a little bit more into the pneumococcal pneumonia uh, guidelines. So the, uh, the, the recommended uh, 
immunization course for uh, for someone who's not been uh, vaccinated before is to get Prevnar 13, then 23, at least two months apart. Then you could get another dose of 23 five years after the previous one. However, for individuals who are older, 65 or over, um, it, it's it's uh, probably uh, appropriate to get one dose of Prevnar 23 at least five years after the most recent one. For um, individuals individuals who are 65 years or older, perhaps only one dose may be appropriate. Uh, part of this um, is complicated for CLL patients again, because uh, the guidelines aren't that straightforward. And also, as I mentioned, we do not know for sure how vigorous the vaccination response is. Uh, we are, and others are continuing to look at that. Now, the cautions um, for vaccination are in this complicated slide. The reason I show it to you is just to highlight in the red circle that a contraindicated in CLL are these live or attenuated vaccines uh, that are listed here for you. Uh, one way to, uh, to uh, take advantage of the knowledge of this is to go to uh, a travel clinic. Many hospitals and clinics have them. I, I know Mayo Clinic has their own. Uh, physicians and travel clinics, uh, physicians or, or other caregivers, um, PAs or NPs who are very versed in what you should and should not take, uh, and, and also based on uh, your disease status. The Schengen's vaccine is important to emphasize this has really been a major advance. Um, almost everyone over 50 years of age are living with the virus that causes shingles, and one in three will get shingles in their lifetime. And the older live vaccine, uh, Zostavax, is contraindicated. Do not accept that vaccine because you can activate shingles. However, Shingrex is an FDA-approved vaccine for the prevention of herpes zoster. And it's two doses. There's a baseline initial one and then one three months later. Uh, we've actually tried to, and I believe we've now just completed a trial that uh, was run by Samir Freak, looking at the extent of the vaccine responses and whether there's protection, zero, what we call zero protection by receiving this. We do advise it though. So consider that if you've not gotten it. Additional considerations. Again, I'll emphasize intravenous immunoglobulin. So if, if uh, you were found to be hypogamma globulinemic and you had recurrent bacterial infections. And here I'm gonna emphasize that these are probably ones that um, would be considered more serious if they require antibiotics and you need to go into the hospital. If these were seen two or three times per year, we do consider the administration of intravenous uh, immunoglobulin, IVIG. Uh, you can now get these intramuscularly as well. Antiviral and pneumocystis prophylaxis would not be recommended for early stage patients, only those on uh, certain therapies. PET scans, uh, I raise that uh, to your conscious level because sometimes it would be done if your caregiver thought that there was a transformation, uh, perhaps to what's called Richter's transformation or secondary development of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so there, those might be indicated if there was a change in uh, your physical exam. Transfusions would not necessarily urge, uh, be rel uh, relevant to you uh, as an early stage patient, However, uh, patients who do progress on our own therapy, uh, in the old days of purine nucleosides or alemtuzumab, we were concerned about um, getting graft-versus-host disease and would irradiate. I don't think that would be necessary for an early-stage patient should they require a transfusion. So in summary, this is my last slide. Most early-stage CLL will have no need for therapy for years. There are new tools, as I review for you, to predict risk for progression, and I think are important to get uh, up front as soon as uh, one does have that diagnosis. Very important to be aware of clinical complications, such as predilection for serious infections and second cancers. And uh, as I highlighted at the end of my talk, supportive care can be helpful for prevention and management of clinical issues. Uh, Brian, uh, I'll stop there and be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. K. Uh, this was really helpful and uh, very thorough and kind of
packed in with a lot of information here. And I want to reassure people that this will be available on the uh, website within a week, uh, both the slides and the audio uh, to go over it. Because I find with my CLL knowledge, I've got to go over things, read papers two or three times to get it all uh, sinking in. We have a ton of questions. Let's do our polling questions first. And let's take a look here. So, you know, quite a movement there in terms of I think people are more confident in terms of what tests they need and certainly uh, more confident in terms of what uh, early care. And uh, so that's what we wanted to do. And we're really pleased. We have a ton of questions and let me apologize uh, from mm -hmm. the, the front that we're not going to get them all. But so I'm going to ask you, Dr. K, if we can make the answers um, kind of is well, they don't have to be rushed, but we'll we'll go through them. Let me start with I'll one. Be, I'll try. I'll try to be cryptic. Yeah, one okay. question that a lot of people ask that these are kind of more philosophical questions here um, is, why did I get CLL? I get that that question's shown up in a number of different ways. What do we know about that, or do we know anything? Uh, great question, and um, let me mention uh, relatively quickly: CLL is the most common leukemia in North America. And uh, we believe that in large part, um, it is genetically determined. Um, as I mentioned, it has the highest rate of familial uh, incidence of all the malignant, of all the leukemias. And uh, we believe right now, it's not totally proven that your individuals are born with a genetic predisposition and that perhaps one other hit, a toxin, a chemical, a solvent, we, we're still working on that, occurs that flips uh, the switch, if you will, to, to develop CLL. Uh, we, we don't think it's necessarily related to, um, uh, to, to any other obvious exposure. We've looked, at the, my, one of my colleagues, Susan Slager, has looked extensively at the epidemiology, that is the lifestyle and the past medical history, and not a lot comes out. What does come out is that people are born with what we call germline genetic uh, changes. These are what you're born with uh, that seem to predict. And so there is a genetic predisposition, predisposition and something else, which we're still working on. So a follow-up question that's similar to this is, why do some people with similar disease have symptoms, uh, uh, like painful nodes, and large spleen, fatigue, and other people have no symptoms? Do we understand that? Uh, we know that there's different prognostic predictive factors and it's a very heterogeneous or variable disease, but we do, do we know why some people seem like it's a non-event, their CLL, and for others, they're quite symptomatic? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is we don't know. Um, the complication that uh, is really mind boggling, Brian, is that likely, the reason for progression in, we, another, in one patient versus another is that there is a tremendous amount of what we call crosstalk or interaction between the host, that is a given person, and the leukemic cells in a way that facilitates disease, uh, the, the cell to survive and even to proliferate. I can give one, one concrete example of that. Uh, there is um, no question that the bone marrow nurtures CLB cells. They like to go back there and get, if you will, uh, in better shape because in the blood they do lose some energy and some abilities to survive. When they go back to the bone marrow, they get, they get, they get their tank filled again. And, and it looks like uh, some of that interaction is much more facilitating for turnover, for more cells to survive, for more cells to divide and to produce other cells. So uh, we don't know, and we, uh, that's obviously a quest that I and many others have. Uh, it's not just about knowing those prognostics, but what are the key events that permit these cells to keep, keep going and keep dividing? It's a complicated question, and we don't have a definitive answer. Um, I have a number of questions on the prognostic factors, and I'll kind of run through them a little bit uh, with you. Um, can you review for us um, uh, some of the FISH studies? And this is where you look at the actual chromosomes inside the right. nucleus. Um, uh, 
Uh, trisomy 12, what does that mean? That means that there are three copies of chromosome 12. You should only have two. Typically, that's associated with um, CLL that does have um, a more aggressive course than, say, 13Q, which would be the most favorable. Uh, but these patients still uh, are, do not behave as aggressively as individuals with 17P. So there's a hierarchy where uh, trisomy 12 is kind of in the middle. And these patients do often respond very nicely to chemoimmunotherapy, the old gold standard chemoimmunotherapy with FCR or PCR in a statin. Um, but, um, but they are more aggressive than 13Q. And again, they're not, we don't quite understand why that is. Uh, there are six common abnormalities in the FISH test, um, trisomy 12, 6Q, 11Q, 13Q, um, 13, uh, 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 and, and, and then having a normal FISH test. And then I mentioned that uh, the FISH panel includes an ability to discriminate between CLL and mantle cell lymphoma because they can look alike. This FISH panel is done routinely pretty much everywhere. And uh, it's a good test to get. And I should mention, by the way, uh, Brian, that test will change. That's the one genetic prognostic test that does change over time. And, and that's why we always talk to patients about test before treat, because you, uh, most CLL evolves over time. And sadly, it usually evolves in a more aggressive or more difficult to treat direction. So whatever testing you had done before your first treatment or at time of diagnosis may be different uh, you know, a year later or five years later, and that needs to be repeated yes. in terms of the fish. Um, uh, can you comment on 11Q? There is a number of questions on that. Yeah, 11Q is a, is a genetic defect that, where there's a missing piece of the, of the short arm 11, the chromosome 11, seems to be associated with a particular gene called ATM. Um, and uh, the clinical presentation for patients with 11Q is a little bit different in that they do tend to have more aggressive disease, particularly more obvious lymph node enlargement. And um, that again highlights what we, Brian and I were talking about earlier. A patient may not have 11Q at presentation, but with progression of disease, they may develop 11Q. Uh, we th think about it in particular if there's more lymph nodes. So that's um, uh, kind of a, a quick comment about 11Q. It does not preclude a good response though, treatment. In normal versus complex karyotype? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that is uh, basically looking at what we call conventional cytogenetics. So we did not do that in the past because CLL, the chemic cells don't turn over. You need them to proliferate or divide. Uh, however, uh, there's a novel technique where we give them a stimulus to divide. And uh, with this stimulus, we can now do cytogenetics. And it turns out that um, uh, for a given patient, if there is a, is, if there's three or more chromosomes using this, if you will, conventional cytogenetics, if there are three or more uh, abnormalities, three different chromosomes, it's called complex, complex karyotype. And uh, those individuals tend to have more aggressive disease. It is not done routinely, Brian. Uh, it is beginning to be integrated into the workup of CLL patients. Uh, you can order that in various uh, clinics, but not in all. And the and uh, that, and, sorry, and that can change as well. One might not have complex at the beginning, and it can become more complex. And uh, one last uh, prognostic question. Could you explain, a lot of people are confused about mutated versus unmutated. And we use that as a shorthand right. to explain IGVH or IGHV, depending on right. which, uh, yeah. Right. And right. can you, that, that's a little confusing for a lot of patients. Sure. Uh, very good question. So mutated sounds like it should be bad because yeah. you're mutated, but it's not. It's actually good. Uh, everything else being equal, if there is no mutation across the, and it's just a specific part of the gene that codes for the immunoglobulin variable region in the heavy chain, I realize that's a lot of jargon, but it's, it's simply put, it's one gene in your complement of genes of the 3 million genes that we have that 
you can read across the code. If the code for that gene is not mutated, it's called unmutated. And uh, unfortunately, for those individuals who have the unmutated IGVH gene, those patients uh, progress much faster than those individuals with a mutated IGVH. So it's actually the converse of what you would hear for a mutated 17P, where that's we don't like that. Uh, for the mutated IGVH, we do like that. And uh, I'm sorry, one more, CD38. Uh, can yes. you comment on that? That used to be very popular. It seems less important now. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, it, you're correct. It's not as popular. We're using uh, CD49D much more than CD38. Uh, 49D has really superseded 38. They're both basically important to know because they tend to tie uh, cement, if you will, the leukemic cell interaction with the bone marrow where it gets some nurturing. Uh, 49D is a very important flow parameter to look at, uh, but was not in the Clippy. Uh, we're trying to see if it belongs there. Uh, but uh, I would not do, be, uh, we don't routinely do 38 anymore. And uh, uh, the progression of MBL to CLL, in, and if you're in watch and wait in CLL, progression to needing treatment, is there anything we as patients can be doing to prevent the MBL from becoming CLL or preventing our CLL to the point where we need treatment? The answer is we don't know. Um, we don't know how to predict the one to 2% that will progress, Brian. Um, but think about that. Over 10 years, only 10% will progress. Um, and even if they did progress, and the individual did, there's really lots of effective therapies. I, I realize that sounds, you know, um, it's not very informative in some ways, but we are working hard to predict uh, which patients will progress. We don't know. I would say uh, my, my strongest advice would be to stay fit, eat well, uh, eat well, uh, live well, because, um, and, and st I, I don't mean that facetiously, it's important to be fit and to have good uh, organ function, good liver, kidney, lung function, because uh, your treatments, if you did progress, um, work better if you're fit. Uh, so I, I just encourage, you know, I, I wish we could be better at predicting this. I think we'll get there, we're not there now, uh, but my best um, suggestion is stay fit. And what about if you have CLL and you, you want to, uh, first, uh, there, reassure us that there are a number of patients that you see that never need treatment, uh, that stay and watch and wait forever. And how, what can I do if I want to be one of those patients? Yeah, a great question too. Um, so uh, the old literature, it might be still close, is that 70% of all CLO patients might never require therapy. Now, to a certain extent, that was a little dilettante because we weren't diagnosing CLO. This was maybe... 10 or 15 years ago, I felt pretty confident saying that. So that meant that uh, three out of 10 patients would require therapy. But I, I, I still stand by this, Brian. I think a more than 50% of patients will not progress uh, to anywhere needing therapy over their lifetimes. And um, you know, a little bit depends on when you were diagnosed, of course. If you were diagnosed in your 40s, uh, perhaps that, you know, that parameter might change, but, um, you know, the, the median age for diagnosis is 72. And um, uh, I, I think it's entirely possible and highly likely that a rise zero to one where they have a low CLPI, you know, remember that low, that low CLI IPI are at extremely, in extremely favorable. And add to that, if they have two or three years of follow-up to confirm that, that they should feel pretty good about where they're going. Uh, um, I'm frustrated here because we're running low on time. So I, I'll throw a couple real quickies at you. Green tea extract, I can't let you get away without uh, yeah. a question on that. Yeah. Um, so uh, we know that uh, uh, EGCG, epigallocatechin, does work in CLO patients. We've done phase one and two clinical trials. It does reduce lymphocytes levels. It does reduce lymph nodes. Uh, so we published uh, those trials, Brian. Uh, we wanted to do a phase three, but could not for various reasons that we'll, we'll get into. Um, I would love to do another trial uh, with uh, EGCG. You can get over-the-counter product. Um, we could talk about, about that offline. I'm happy to 
have patients uh, contact me if they want to. Uh, we are very keen to do a phase three where we would combine EGCG. And now this is the good EGCG. So we got this green tea for, uh, from the NCI, which was uh, in turn uh, sent to them by a company in Japan. We don't have access to that. We do, we do think we can do it. And uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to even crowdsource that if I can be so bold. Uh, I think it should be tried. All right. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have to end. Well, God, I have so many great questions here. Um, tumor necrosis factor. You've done a lot of research on that. Is there any thought that uh, that is that elevated in um, CLL? Should we be, would, it, yeah. would we have high blood levels? Should we be treating that? Yeah. Um, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, is secreted by CLL B cells. We think it relates a lot to some of the low blood count, low platelets, low. Um, low immune system function. And um, my colleagues and I are trying to devise trials where we actually block TNF. There are, uh, there are antibodies uh, that can block this. So we do have, we do, well, there's good rationale, there's good uh, pathobiology, good, good uh, understanding of, uh, of the biology of this and, uh, and good reasons for wanting to block it. And this might ultimately be a trial in early stage CLL patients, by the way, because these, um, these reagents are less toxic and might be something we would consider and, in the future. Uh, this has got to be the last question. Fatigue is one of the most common yeah. symptoms. What advice do you give your patients who are tired with their CLL? Yeah, well, that's also a critical question. We see it a lot. And um, our belief is it's related to the material that the CLL B cell is secreting. Uh, they, they're so-called hormones being secreted. We call them cytokines. Interleukin-2, TNF, uh, these, 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 are, these make people feel lousy. Uh, some of these same uh, hormones can be secreted by your immune system when you have the flu, when you feel terrible. It, to, to me, we, we wish we could go ahead with therapies to block that. It, it is not an indication for therapy, but I would agree it's a common finding. It's not yet agreed to that patients should be treated uh, routinely for that if that's their main symptom. We have to do better. I'm going to stop here and hand it over to our communications director, Patty, for the last couple of slides. Thank you, Dr. K. This was incredibly uh, valuable. Thanks, Brian. We would like, once again, like to thank our supporters, Genentech, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Adaptive Biotechnologies for making this presentation possible. Please take a moment to complete our webinar survey. Your feedback is important to us, and all attendees who have completed the survey will receive a free CLL-specific bag from Bagit. Thank you all for attending. And the, I'm going to add that the uh, CLL Society provided the uh, information that is CLL-specific in that uh, uh, Bagit. Uh, this is pretty cool. So. Um, uh, please consider completing that uh, survey for us and you'll and we'll mail these our bag it will mail these bags to you um, and it has uh, some pretty good information on CLL for you. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for attending. And um, I think that's the end of the meeting here. We appreciate your time. Dr. K, thank you. Thank you to my whole team for putting this together. <laughs>